marketing and customer programs people to be increasing the focus that they put on engaging the executives at their client sites, not just the power users or the end users uh, who, who might be parts of our programs today. So that, that's why I thought it would be really good for us to talk about that and really dig into what do executives want? How do they like to be engaged? So with that, let me turn it over to Rob. Take it away, Rob. Right. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Really, really appreciate the opportunity and have had a chance to catch some of the conference. Uh, really just great content. And as you said at the end of the last session, Jeff, I think this is a nice follow on to the discussion about advisory boards. Uh, we'll kind of build out from there. Uh, very uh, quickly, just want to say that we're going to try and do two things at once over the next hour. I've got a lot of material, a lot of research, and some case studies that I want to share, but I want to make this totally interactive. Um, so let's have a conversation. Let's use the chat and um, you'll get the slides one way or the other, I think. So um, no worries if we don't cover all the planned material. The point is really, uh, as Jeff said, to have a good conversation about executive engagement. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is cover four basic topics. And as I say, I'm gonna share some research from ITSMA uh, as we go. Um, so four big things, one, the big opportunity, it's actually a incredible time, possibly even a golden age for executive engagement. And I'll talk about why that's the case. But at the same time, it, there's an enormous challenge. So as Jeff said, why do executives even want to engage with us as solution providers? Um, then we'll talk very practically about what's working. So advisory boards, absolutely. but other kinds of programs and initiatives. And then finally, one of the toughest questions is building an integrated approach, what we call orchestrating executive engagement, avoiding random acts of executive engagement. So talk about all four of these super quick. If, if folks don't know ITSMA, we are a research and advisory firm that works with um, large technology and professional services, business services, um, B2B companies on marketing strategy, sales, um, account-based marketing. We can kind of claim credit, Jeff, for inventing. Um, inventing is pushing it a little bit maybe, but we really did actually coin the term back in 2003 and really helped to codify the approach and discipline working with companies like IBM and Accenture uh, at that time and do an enormous amount of work on, on, on ABM as well as executive engagement, thought leadership, some of the things that go into strategic relationships with key accounts. So that's the backdrop. Again, I'm going to go through a batch of material, but absolutely jump in, stop me. I've got a couple of polls that I want to talk about and uh, you know, let's get the conversation going. Typical housekeeping, housekeeping stuff, uh, don't need to spend time on that. But I do want to spend a minute defining the term. Um, you know, account-based marketing has exploded in recent years, and now you've got 50 different definitions for what that is. Executive engagement is as mushy in a lot of cases. So we define executive engagement as building relationships with senior buyers in the organizations with which you want to do business and with other senior executives who those buyers trust. This is long term and it's a strategy. And the focus for us, at least, and a lot of the companies we work with is about creating mutual value. So this is not transactional. This is not about selling, or it's not just about selling. It's really about building long-term trusted relationships, which will have many, many benefits over time. And part of the reason I stress that is because one of the stickiest questions with executive engagement is measurement, as with all parts of marketing or customer marketing. And so we've actually worked with companies that 
have a definition and a metric, but it's very transactional. And so pro marketing programs will say executive engagement is a priority for us. And if there are C-suite executives that attend a webinar and then maybe download a white paper and we can track that they've spent a half an hour with us, we'll call them engaged. Um, that's a useful thing to look at as far as we're concerned, but that's not what that's not really what executive engagement is all about. That may be a contributor. So I just want to lay that out there because that's context for everything that we're going to talk about. Um, so, all right, let me, I actually want to start with a poll. And so I'm curious, how are your organizations working with executives today? I've given you four choices. We have a formal program within our customer X, because I know you all have different, you know, names for the programs that you're leading. Um, within our program, separate from our program, it's an informal focus, or we don't really even have a focus at all. So Jeff, thank you. I see folks are jumping in. Excellent, excellent. I'm getting a sense of where we're going, but let's uh, let's get everybody's responses and then we can share and talk about them for a minute. Great. All right, Jeff, thank you. So interesting. Um, we see here that only a, min a minority have a formal program, some within, some not within your programs or the customer X programs. Um, others an informal focus. So that puts us into a majority that at least it's a focus. And interestingly, a third say that it's not even a focus at all. Um, so we love to hear comments in the chat about that as we go, and I can pick up on those. Um, the for, for the first few folks who mentioned that there is a formal program, but it's outside of, I'm assuming, your program, um, we see that a lot. And that's one of these orchestration questions that I want to talk about later, because often you go after some of the same execu uh, executives. And so there can be a coordination challenge. Um, within is great. Um, you know, that's fantastic. And, you know, companies organize these in, in a lot of different ways, but, but that's really useful. Informal is quite common from what we see over the last three, four years. Um, we've seen a lot of investment in executive engagement activities, customer advisory boards, like we were just talking about, um, executive sponsorship programs, a variety of things. And I'll show you what um, a range of program initiatives looks like. And no clear focus um, that, of course, depending on your business, that may be fine. Um, a lot of the companies we work with, again, have made this a more important focus in recent years and are looking to formalize and structure. Um, and I'll tell you why as we um, get into this. All right, let's, um, we could probably close that out, Jeff. Oh, have you been sharing, Jeff? Yeah, it was, it, it, it oh, should great. be closed okay. out. Yep, you great. can go on. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks guys. So. Let's talk about the big opportunity uh, for now. And this is especially this year, this insane, crazy, upside down year of 2020. So the reality for the vast majority of senior business executives that we are working with, that I'm guessing you and your companies are working with, is that there is a radical uncertainty. Um, you know, if in February, March, April, people were thinking that we may get past this pandemic over a period of months, 
that maybe by the fall or the winter, we'd be back to normal, whatever normal means. Um, nobody thinks that anymore. And, and, and it's obviously not just the pandemic. We've had all kinds of disruption this year globally, as well as in the US from social justice movements to wildfires and hurricanes. And I can't believe Louisiana's got yet another hurricane right now. Um, so to the extent that there's any sense of a new normal, it is this extremely foggy and uncertain future, and we are not sure at all where we're going. And when I say we, and when I talk about executives, I'm really grounding this in research that ITSMA does. And I'm gonna share some data as we go, but every year we survey hundreds of C-suite and other senior level buyers and decision makers internationally from a variety of industries, mainly large companies uh, and people who are involved in purchasing high value solutions. So these are CIOs and CFOs and CMOs and CEOs, COOs, you know, all of the, the CXO landscape. Um, in 2020, we've actually done two waves because this year is so crazy. So we did an early wave in May where we wanted to get a sense of what were the reactions to the first part of the pandemic. And then we just finished a second wave in September. Now, we haven't even fully published any of this yet. So I'm going to give you a bit of a sneak preview. We uh, at ITSMA, we had our own conference last week and we shared some of the initial findings last week. So we're just beginning to roll this out. Um, so this sense of uncertainty is enormous. However, um, uh, what we call the innovation imperative has now taken center stage. So Leaders of large companies, for the most part, made a very strong pivot from May, June to now. So the first few months of this pandemic was all about reaction and everybody's got to work at home and my supply chain is completely disrupted and oh my, you know, I mean, it was tough. We all lived through it, right? I mean, it was brutal this spring. Um, but senior execs fairly quickly within a few months realized, okay, this is not ending anytime soon. We need to adjust and we need to figure out how to move from reactive to proactive. And an enormous part of that is about innovation. Um, you know, the cliche is that companies have done three years of digital transformation over the last several months. But it's far more than that. It is absolutely that, but it's far more than that as well. And so companies and, and business leaders are absolutely defining new opportunities for growth, new ways of organizing their business, new partners and ecosystems. They're looking to you guys, you know, as solution providers for new ideas and new approaches. Um, you know, so made that pivot. That gives us an enormous opportunity to engage at the executive level because they are hungry for new ideas. So here's a little bit of data from the studies that I've just been men uh, just mentioned. And we asked executives, and this is just from last month, from September, what are your top business priorities now? And what are your top technology investments now? And what you can see here, and there was a little bit of a change from our May survey. What you can see here is the focus is on growth and transformation and innovation. And that's on the left-hand side with the business priorities. Cutting costs is now lower down. It was a little bit higher up, not surprisingly, in the spring. But, you know, this is about how do we grow? How do we prosper? How do we thrive in this new uncertainty? And on the technology side, you can see ramping up investments in the infrastructure that enables digital business and di digital innovation. Um, amazingly, perhaps, maybe you're not surprised, spending on technology by and large 
is increasing from 2020 budgets at the beginning of the year. Some companies, of course, are cutting. They've been hit so hard by you know, the economic disruption. But overall, across multiple industries, what we see is that companies are spending even more money now on technology than they were planning at the beginning of the year. And so this is, again, it's, you know, security is the necessary investment as every, you know, everybody, there's so much more remote work and, and, and digital collaboration, um, but moving faster to cloud, faster to AI, faster to collaborative ways of working, faster to IoT and sort of broader digital transformation overall. So this is just an enormous opportunity for us to have conversations at a more senior level than we've ever had before because they're hungry for new ideas, for what works, how do we go faster? Um, I had a company that I'm working with that um, interestingly deals with remote work. And one of their priorities for 2020 was getting into the chief HR space, CHROs, right? And by June, they had blown out all their objectives for what they were trying to accomplish in 2020 because chief human resources officers were calling them all of a sudden. So it's an enormous opportunity for us. And what's also really interesting, one more bit of data here is that they are turning to solution providers faster and more uh, at a higher level than other sources of thought leadership and innovation. So you can see professional services and systems integrators and tech providers at the top of the list here, which sources of information do you trust the most? And management consultants and industry analysts have taken a hit on this because they're typically talking about broader approaches and frameworks and long-term visions. And the focus is much more on how do we move faster now? We were gonna do a cloud migration over the next four years. We gotta get it done this year. It's like, okay, yes, I have a framework for doing great cloud migration from Gartner, sorry to pick on them, but uh, you know, fine. I need actual practical help. So this interesting combination of innovation with practical approaches plays to our strengths. So often we took a back seat to some of the analysts and manager and consulting firms and even academics when it came to real thought leadership, that shifted. So huge, huge opportunity for us. And I, you know, I mentioned earlier a golden age for executive engagement. And this is a quote that I stole from, from a, a partner of ours, Boardroom Insiders. I don't know if anybody uses or, or knows them, but they're a fantastic research group that does executive level profiles and networking connections and really support executive engagement in a variety of ways. And so Sharon Gillenwater, their uh, co-president or you know, co-founder, um, I had her on a webcast recently and she's like, this is a golden age for executive engagement. And I think she's absolutely right. Um, so there's a huge, huge opportunity, but there's always a but, right? <laughs> so this is not simple, especially and you know, as a lot of folks here today, you don't already have a big formal program in place to build on. So we're earlier and you're in good company. You know, most of us are, are kind of early in investing and developing a real executive engagement approach. Um, and I should just say that, you know, maybe I skipped over this a little bit too quickly. Um, Jeff, you flagged it at the beginning, like why does this matter? Um, it matters because the kinds of shifts that companies, the companies we serve are making are strategic and the decisions are made in the C-suite. So if you're deciding we have to do this cloud migration twice as quickly, then somebody else's budgets are being cut in order to fund that. And that's the CIO with the CFO and the CEO making that decision. 
And so if you're not in that conversation, number one, you may not get what could be a huge new opportunity to support that, but you also may be on the outs because what you were working on all of a sudden is off the priority list. So in times like this of rapid change and rapid dis uh, disruption, the decision-making goes up and the priorities get tighter. And the biggest competition we have is no decision or delay. It's not our direct competitor. Um, you know, we can deal with that at the VP and director level often, but all decisions now are becoming more strategic and they're moving up. And so that's why this matters. That's why it's so important. And that's been a trend in general as digital transformation accelerated over the last three or four years, we already were seeing a lot of the big decisions moving higher up, even to the board level, but it's much, much more the case. It took another huge jump forward this year. So that's the why. The opportunity is there, but the challenge is enormous. So first challenge, of course, is don't bother me, I'm busy, right? Um, you know, we're not the only ones that appreciate that, oh my gosh, we need to get to the C-suite of our customers, even if we weren't there before. Everybody is doing this there. So they're anxious for new ideas, but they're also incredibly busy. You know, the first part of this year was all about crisis management. One of the interesting things we've seen is making crisis management behavior more permanent. So the C-suite meetings every week you know, or every day, you know, which you don't normally do, but in a crisis you do, a lot of that is becoming more institutionalized. Um, so they're incredibly busy. They were always incredibly busy, but they're incredibly busy. So just connecting, just reaching is really, really difficult. Um, what that means is that we need to really understand them. And this is not at a role level, like, oh, CEOs are focused on this, or CIOs are focused on this or even a persona level, like, you know, my little market, hopefully people know the marketunist who love those cartoons about, about marketing. Um, we need to really, really do our homework at the individual level. I mean, it's why customer advisory boards are so great, not only because we get to learn about the issues and so on, we get to really understand the individuals and we can apply a lot of that learning, but very carefully to look alike people in lookalike accounts. So really, really, you know, what's going on in these industries? What's going on in these accounts? When we ask executives, what is most important to them when solution providers like us are reaching out to them? Top of the list is know my business. You know, that's not my industry, it's my business. Know my role, know my personal issues, professional personal issues. So we need to really, really understand them and be hyper relevant in the moment, or it's much, much more difficult to connect. So that's the first part of the challenge. Related to that is understanding why the executives we want to reach may want to engage with us. So this is actually from last year's study. We didn't ask quite the same question this year because there were so many other things we wanted to get at. Um, but we wanted to understand what motivates you to join an advisory board, for example, or just to spend time, you know, your CIO with my CIO. And what we learned is that there are multiple motivations and some of them, you know, the question here is what's your primary reason? So we forced people to pick one. And no one of them rose to the top. So that's already helpful for us. You can't just say, oh, they want to meet with their peers. That's absolutely the top priority for some executives. For some, it's established relationships with your senior executives. 
Some of it's more educational. Some of it is influence. They want to influence what you're doing in your direction. Some of it is get deeper into development. Absolutely networking. Some of it, this other one is interesting in terms of um, I want to build my own career. You know, are we giving them a platform to build visibility, to demonstrate leadership, to take on leadership? So we need not only to understand who they are, what their role is, what their business priorities are, what their control is, but why they might want to engage with us. And the reality is this doesn't hold for everything, right? So why they might want to engage with ITSMA or SLAP5 is not the same reason why they might want to engage with Accenture or IBM. So really, really important uh, to understand that. Um, all right, and then the last thing that makes this so difficult is consistency and quality. So this is a brand new question from just last month when we asked executives, in the last three months, in which of the following ways have you engaged with solution providers? And so you can see it's a lot, right? I've read your emails, I've gotten on a video call, I've had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I've gotten, you know, uh, a bottle of wine or a meal because direct mail is, is on a bit of a comeback. I've read your stuff, you know, in person, which I've gotten italics at the very bottom. There's, there is a little bit of that going on, but obviously not very much. So again, they're absolutely willing to engage. They are engaging. It might be your competitors, if not you, but this is a lot of ways in which we need to be relevant, we need to be at very high quality, and we need to provide value because time is the most precious commodity. And so how do we do this consistently across different channels with different people? I mean, that's what's so challenging about this because the reality is every one of these touch points is a moment of truth. And I think we all know, and I'm sure from our own experience, you know, one bad experience can outweigh five good ones. So this is part of the challenge. So again, I, you know, I keep picking on the customer advisory boards. A lot of us run really, really good advisory boards and it's a great experience and there's a lot of value and you're meeting at least a few of those motivations. But meanwhile, are they getting dinged by an irrelevant email? Or they decide, okay, oh, the advisory board meeting was great. I'm going to join this webinar, and the webinar was off key. So that gets at this orchestration challenge, quality, consistency, and orchestrated experience over time, because the negatives really do, um, you know, can outweigh the positives pretty quickly. So. Again, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, so please just jump in and you know use the chat. I've got the chat window open with any questions on any of this. Um, all right, I'm going to shift now to what works. What do we see? Again, you know we do a ton of research. We work with a lot of companies that are running big executive engagement programs. What do we see that works? The first point is there's no one right answer. And the most effective programs and companies take a portfolio approach. So this is a little bit of a heat map uh, going from top right back <laughs> down and left. And so many of the companies that are running, that you know, are investing seriously in executive engagement are running many of these kinds of activities and programs, all of which can be very effective. Thought leadership is often the foundation. And I know we've been, you know, in this conference talking about thought leadership as well. Uh, and that gets directly to that innovation imperative that I talked about a couple of minutes ago. So that's a core and that helps drive uh, and give the fuel really for a lot of these other programs. But 
Um, you can see I've got a little bit down executive councils or advisory boards or networks. You know, one of the interesting things we've seen in recent months is companies, and I think this came up in the last session, companies that have, um, you know, customer advisory boards or executive councils morphing them into more of a network approach where you're inviting more people in, you're meeting more frequently, but for shorter periods of time because it's all virtual and putting even more emphasis on facilitating that peer networking, maybe even offline. But anyway, that's a huge one. Um, executive sponsorship programs, that's more of a one-to-one, -one, like your CIO to their CIO, your CMO to their CMO, taking a more formal role. I mean, I'm guessing a lot of you, maybe with your very top accounts, have some of that. It may not be formalized or structured, but it just kind of happens. Um, formalizing that is a good thing. Innovation programs, really, really important. Again, structuring more collaborative innovation at the executive level, not just at the kind of tech developer level, but more business visioning, uh, future planning kinds of things, future scenarios. Executive briefing centers, huge investment in recent years in physical spaces that are cool to bring executives through. Again, now a lot of morphing into doing that in a virtual. I'll show you a quick example in a couple of minutes of that. But then all kinds of other programs as well. So executive event, you know, round tables, dinners, executive events, account-based marketing, which itself often encompasses many of these things. And that's a really, really important intersection. If folks have an account-based marketing program, how does that tie to executive engagement? Because often ABM is designed to help elevate relationships to the executive level, but sometimes executive programs are disconnected. So they're going after different executives <laughs> or executives from different accounts. So that's an important connection point. Um, executive education is an interesting one. And then think about some of these others, like if you're doing philanthropy, corporate social responsibility, community service kinds of things, is there an executive layer to that? We've seen some really good success with those kinds of things. And then social media, social networks. So, you know, variety of programs. And I'm curious, I wanna do another poll here. And um, we, we realized we hit the limits of Zoom where Zoom can only, you can only ask about 10 things. So um, I've got a list of 13, but we picked the top 10 and I'm curious um, even if it's not part of your program, do you know that your company is, you know, which of these things do you know that your company has in place now? So just tick off as many as you think are, uh, are ongoing. Excellent. And Rob, we should probably leave this one open a little bit longer since yeah. people have to do a lot of clicking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, oh, but... so hope, hopefully, too, as you and again, you'll get all the slides. But as you look at this, it'll spark some thinking about, oh, you know, this could be an interesting type of program to explore or in terms of just connecting and aligning with existing programs um, outside of your own, where there may be a good connection point. So let's uh, give this another minute, Jeff. Looks like the responses have slowed down. So I'll just end it and show you the results here. Great. Can you see, the, can you see that? Yes. All right, well, good. Thought, so thought, thought leadership. Yeah, 100%. Thought leadership, thought leadership at the top. And then I think uh, executive councils or advisory boards. That's great. And then, ref, 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 of course. <laughs> so that's, you guys are leading. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, so more like roughly half with a lot of these others executive relationship programs, innovation programs, executive events, briefing centers. Okay, so. And I'm guessing it's not the same half <laughs> for the most part. Right. These, are, these are substantial investments um, over time. And I think, you know, the way you want to think about this is 
once you have a clear sense of who the executives are that you're trying to reach, you know, then you can begin to think about their motivations, what would provide value to them, use your advisory board and use your reference program to talk about some of these other kinds of initiatives and get a sense of what might be valuable, what might be useful for them. Um, you know, and then over time, look at maybe we add one or two next year or, you know, uh, every quarters, things like that. And, and Rob, one thing that would really interest yeah. me is that I'd, I'd love people who answered yes to thought leadership or who clicked that one. If in the chat, if you can just say me, if, if you are directly involved in driving engagement with these executives to lead that thought leadership, or is there just something going on in product management or Marcoms that you know is some thought leadership program mm. and publishing white papers and things like that, but you're not involved. So if you are involved, just say me. And because and then I, I would love to, Rob, if you know, since everybody yeah. since there were so many clicks, if you could talk a little bit about what some great examples are of companies that have done executive level engagement around thought leadership and, and really gotten these executives to amplify the company's own yeah. thought leadership platform and big ideas and positions. So, Jeff, I, I swear this was not planned, but that is the perfect segue. Okay. Um, because that's exactly where I'm going. <laughs> oh, beautiful. All right. The thought yeah. leadership. So that's, that's perfect. And it's fabulous that we literally got 100% on thought leadership. Um, so I'm going to talk about three priorities. So I just laid out 13 different types of programs. But what I'm going to zero in on now is, is three priorities. And thought leadership is first and foremost. So three big takeaways from our research. One is that thought leadership is absolutely essential and more important than ever to drive executive engagement. Second is that high touch interactive approaches remain essential even with the shift to digital. Um, so again, advisory boards are typically in person, very high touch, totally interactive. We need to look at other ways to do that digitally. And then finally is the sales piece and sales really, really needs to step up. This has been, again, this is not a new issue. None of these are new issues, but it's taken another step forward this year. Sales needs to be more consultative at the executive level. So let's talk about thought leadership, Jeff, exactly to your point. First, just some basic data. Um, we asked our, um, our executives, what can solution providers do now, now, September, <laughs> to earn your confidence that they understand your current challenges? And they could pick three. Top leadership was the clear favorite here. Publish high quality thought leadership on relevant business and industry issues. And the asterisk is this is a statistically significant finding. So no matter how many times we do that survey, this is, you know, this is not about a one-time thing. Um, the others, you know, you can see, oh, you can see a batch of, um, you know, batch of other things, but they're, a lot of them are thought leadership oriented or driven. Um, the providing free products and services is kind of interesting. Um, but meet with me without giving me a sales pitch. Engage us in a collaborative innovation process. Demonstrate a deep understanding of my role, my issues, and so on. Okay. So thought leadership, again, is the fuel here uh, around which and on top of which all these other activities can succeed. So here's an interesting example. Um, Optum, big health tech, health data company. It's actually part of United Health Group, the big health insurance company. Um, they, over the last couple of years, have developed a quite powerful and effective C-suite thought leadership program where they said, okay, there are three major roles that we're interested in. The CEO, the CFO, and I always stumble over this with a group of marketers, the chief medical officer. So that's CMO for Optum, not chief, I mean, they have a chief marketing officer, but from an audience perspective, it's chief medical officer. So they have been over the last couple of years building out deep research-based 
strong points of view on the future of healthcare, digital transformation in healthcare. They work with hospital systems and health insurance companies, you know, providers and payers. I mean, some others as well, but those are their core markets. And the beginning of this year, they rolled out a really fabulous program focused on a defined set of accounts. So not really account-based marketing, but they identified top hundreds, not thousands, hundreds of accounts. So you can begin to name the executives that they wanted to reach. And then deep research-based material findings, and then a regular cadence of content around that, you know, blog posts and videos and, and on and on and on, and showcasing their own experts. Pandemic hits, and all of a sudden they had to say, mm, do we need to go forward with this? What do we do? They did a big pause in the spring, revamped the program to make sure, kept the basic, same basic roles, same account focus, same basic issues, but oriented now to we're living in COVID-19 and the future is uncertain. And so revamped a lot of the content and the points of view brought in different kinds of experts, some different partners, and then, you know, started rolling it out again over the summer and into the fall. And it's a really good example of a very integrated approach, which is issue and content based, but designed to set up individual meetings and conversations, online activities and events, all at the executive level, kind of C-suite, C minus C one. Um, so high level, often large companies, not entirely. And this then gives them the ability to have those executive relationship programs, um, executive round tables online, even advisory boards. I think they have a couple of different advisory boards because it's, it grounds the conversation. It's something to talk about. And so that's why, again, it's so, so important to do that. And once you have really good content that's rich and deep, you can go to town with it, with all of these other activities and, and you know, both sort of using social and some of the other ways to promote the content. But if you combine that with knowing who exactly you're trying to reach, then you can start to track, okay, well, did people sign up to get, to subscribe? You know, a lot of it's actually oriented towards driving subscriptions. And, and it's not about let's get 10,000 subscriptions. Let's get 1,000 of the right people because we're not even promoting this much more widely. I mean, some of it's available, but they'll throw you in a different bucket if you want to subscribe and you're not at that senior executive level. So it's a good example of having a focus program, pivoting it to make sure it's really, really relevant now, and then using it as a foundation for a broader executive engagement approach. And, and Rob, could I just ask, since, yeah, since, since you know thought leadership is a passion of mine, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is the, the um, even taking it to the next level, you know, putting out your own thought leadership and engaging your ex the executives in your customer base to be consuming it, um, I know you've worked with some companies like Ernst & Young and others that, that are actually doing going even further in getting capturing the perspectives of those senior executives themselves in the client base to both reinforce and amplify some of the big ideas <clears throat> that the company is putting out there. Oh, and yeah. and that's that. I would think that that would be a big opportunity for the customer X pros uh, as a way of you know moving themselves into an executive engagement role would be around kind of playing that glue between for the th the team that's developing the thought leadership with helping get customers to to reinforce it and communicate their own perspectives around those ideas no it, it is jeff and it, it, it's a great point and and you know i've been working on thought leadership for a long time and one of the toughest balancing acts that you have to do with thought leadership is on the one hand, you're trying to demonstrate your expertise, um, which leads to a, we have the answers. But on the other hand, especially at the executive level, 
they don't believe you have all the answers. They wanna know that you're asking the right questions. They wanna know that you have relevant experience and they wanna know that you have a point of view, but ultimately they also are really smart and really knowledgeable. And so you gotta be careful not to go overboard with thought leadership. And so involving them in early on in the research and not just with surveys and interviews, which is good to do, really good to do. And that's where absolutely these customer advocacy programs can play a great role in connecting, just as you say, Jeff. Um, but even further in co-creating the points of view. So using your advisory boards to test the new approaches we're working on, you know, to use the Optum example, you know, CFO reality check. We've done a bunch of research. We think this is what we're seeing. We want to run through the data with you and talk about it because we want to start. We want to publish a report. Let's involve you in figuring out what this all means. So thought leadership as more of an iterative and collaborative process. Uh, is hugely effective, uh, especially at the executive level. Uh, you know, so a lot of people do surveys and they, they get case studies and they get do interviews, which is all really, really good. And it's a good connection point, but taking it even to that next level of bringing executives inside the thought leadership development process, actually creating the points of view, then they have a stake in it. Then they want to promote it you know, to their teams and their colleagues. Um, and then no question, Jeff, in terms of amplification, we all know that peer sharing is far more effective than direct promotion. Um, you know, I did a, <laughs> I did a, a, a executive engagement uh, panel discussion last week and, and I had the CMO from uh, HSBC, the big bank in Canada saying, okay, I was asking her about executive engagement, but then it's like, you're a CMO, you're an executive, you're getting inundated all the time. Who do you respond to? And she said, well, if my friends tell me I should look at something, I'll look at it. But honestly, the rest of it, I toss, you know, I just don't have time. So getting the folks on your advisory board in your reference and advocacy program to amplify, just as you say, Jeff, hugely effective, you know, peer to peer. Absolutely, absolutely the case. All right, a couple more, couple more quick points. Um, so that's on thought leadership. The next is around types of engagement. And as I said, even with digital, the more intimate kinds of approaches uh, continue to be much more effective. Uh, executives are less interested in broadcast approaches or big events or one way you know, presentations. And so the much more intimate, you know, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or small groups and literally even pick up the phone. You know? I mean, one of the ways to measure executive engagement is, do I have their cell phone number and do they answer if I call? You know, it's pretty simple, but we know, because we know the people that we can just pick up the phone and call. And that's what we're trying to get to with executive engagement where you have the, enough of a trusted connection and relationship where you can call and they pick up the phone or you can text and they pick, you know, and they respond, right? So here's a little bit, I wanna just quickly show you a, a really interesting example that we've been, um, even this morning, I was on a call with a woman from Dell Technology Services, but they have done an incredible job of pulling all these threads together of thought leadership, of virtual uh, activity, of more interactive approach and more customized and personalized approach. So when the pandemic hit, they decided they were gonna build a virtual headquarters for Dell Technologies Services. And they literally went out and built a new platform, um, which is super cool. But what's really powerful about it is this is, it's like an executive briefing center online in that 
It enables a variety of activities from webcasts to roundtable discussions to one on one meetings to tours like factory tours um, to all kinds of do it yourself content consumption. And you can create fully customized pathways and journeys. And you can go with your clients and prospects. So this is pulling also on that salespeople being more consultative thread that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So it's a big investment, but they're thinking long term that we need to create a way to engage executives interactively in personalized and customized ways for the long haul because we hope that you know live events come back and we hope that executive roundtables come back and we hope we can take people to our executive briefing centers at some point. But there are a lot of advantages to digital. It's much less of a time commitment and space is less, you know, less of an issue. So this is a great example of a very sophisticated approach to building a virtual platform that is endlessly customizable down to the individual level. So if I wanna spend an hour with Jeff as the CEO of Slab 5, I can say, Jeff, you know, let's go look at what we're doing. I gotta show you a short video clip over here. Let's have a conversation. Oh, let me pull in my boss you know, my CEO and you guys can chat and then, oh, we've got a, you know, oh, at two o'clock, we've got a couple of your peers coming in. So this is a very high end uh, ambition, <laughs> I think, for a lot of us. And they're still working it out, but it's uh, been extremely, extremely successful thus far. All right, let me just flip through a couple of things. Um, here's the sales point again, just a little bit of data uh, to leave you with. We asked executives, what are the three most important things an account manager or sales rep should be doing? And look at this, educate me on new issues. Give me unique perspectives. Give me advice. This is not tell me about your products or your services or your solutions. This is be an advisor, be a consultant, right? So really, really important. So. This is a, a kind of a burden and an opportunity for marketing now because we need to help and equip our salespeople, our sellers with our thought leadership, with our case studies, with our own executives to enable them to do this and to do it online. You know, a lot of our best salespeople shine because they've got the kind of a personality and the knowledge that works really, really well in a room, you know, when you're face to face. Um, so this is a new environment. I mean, in some ways, I think the transition for sales has been a lot more difficult than it's been for marketing. Um, we already were doing a huge amount online. So um, this is, again, a real opportunity for us as customer marketers to work with sales in a closer way, in a different way, to help them be more consultative with our accounts. Um, I, I have to, I'm going to skip over this one. I have to just show you guys this because this is my new like favorite example. Um, so one of the things with executive engagement is along with all these other kinds of programs and initiatives that are all great, you know, advisory boards and relationship programs and thought leadership and ABM, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is there like some special something that you can provide? So uh, come back to me on this, but Microsoft um, Microsoft Services actually has just created a game called Truths and Insights. So folks, if you remember Cards Against Humanity from a few years ago, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably appreciate this, but they're doing this with C-suite executives, playing a digital game, which is competitive. You actually play to win but the focus is getting people to tell stories, in this case about digital transformation, that they might not otherwise tell. You're making them a little bit uncomfortable, but you're playing a game. So it's bonding, it's fun. 
Um, I actually organized a group recently of marketing leaders and we all played the game and, and it was, uh, we, we really had a good time and nobody knew each other except for me when we played it, but everybody was joking and getting along. And so it's just a, a reminder or a spark here to think differently as well. I mean, gamification is a huge thing and, and um, you know, maybe our, our, uh, our, our parents age executives may be a little bit less attuned, although I think they are too. But, you know, as millennials are moving more and more into the C-suite and then ultimately Gen Z over the next years, games are, are huge, right? So just a thought there and happy to share more on that. My last quick comment, I'm going to leave you. It's a little dense, but I'm going to talk about executive engagement in like one minute. Um, because the risk, and I think even in the polling that we did, we kind of implied this, that there are random acts of executive engagement. There are different programs going on. They're not connected. They're not part of the same overall strategy. And I think I suggested the risks with that. So I want to leave you with a framework that we use at ITSMA to help think about an orchestrated approach, a more integrated approach. So there's a, at the top is actually bringing key stakeholders in the company together to create a unified strategy and approach, which executives, which accounts, which roles, what kinds of programs, how are we gonna go to market essentially, and how are we gonna manage, govern and measure this? So that's at a top layer. Um, and ideally, that's with marketing and sales and probably a couple other groups as well, um, but it's formalized. Then there are five key pieces. I've touched on a bunch of them throughout already. There's that research and insight, a more structured way to really understand which executives and what's going on with them. What do they care about? What are their motivations? How are they already engaging with us? Thought leadership here, content for conversation, the sales enablement piece. Portfolio management, you know, what is the right mix of programs that's going to work and how do we make sure that we're providing enough opportunities for the executives that we want to reach to get value from us in different ways, one-on-one -on -one with their peers, interactive, innovation-oriented, et cetera. And then metrics, um, super short story. We always talk about the three R's, reputation, relationships, and revenue. And I said at the very beginning, executive engagement is a long-term relationship strategy. Uh, and it is, at least the way we define it, but it sh you should be looking at reputation improvements. All of us are trying to reposition ourselves, strengthen our brand, build different kinds of reputation, different markets, different solutions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the executive level carries that reputation for good or not. And so the more we can focus on improving our reputation at the executive level and measuring it, you know, that's all goodness. Relationships almost by definition, but revenue, as we do this, we should see new kinds of opportunities, more sole sourced opportunities, more innovative solutions that we can develop together and sell and so on. Um, but then, and you all know, I mean, you're all in, in, in customer marketing. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's not just about the immediate staff, right? Or the immediate team, it's a larger collaboration. And so we need to get everybody on, oriented to what we're doing and involved and, and, and supportive and educate and train and so on. And so we've seen enormous improvements in collaboration, I think, over the last six months. Um, so there's a lot to build on. So leave you with that. Again, happy to talk about any or all of this. Um, I had a story about orchestration, but we don't have time for that questions, Jeff, I'll show you um, a couple of my takeaways, uh, which maybe help uh, encapsulate this a little bit. And um, lots and lots of resources at itsma.com. We've got events. Some of them are just for members or a fee. A lot of them are no charge whatsoever. Lots of available resources. I actually have a new podcast on C-suite marketing 
which um, I love saying you can get wherever you get your podcasts. So love for folks to uh, check that out too. And we've got a book on executive engagement strategy. So Jeff. Yes. Well, congratulations on the podcast and the book. Yeah. Uh, very, very exciting. And oh my God, Rob, this was fabulous. This, this was just spot on. And I'm hoping everybody else is inspired here in realizing the opportunity that they have to, to participate in this. And, and speaking of that, Rob, I'd love it if you could tell our customer marketer audience, where should they start? Let's say it's either their CEO has come to them and said, hey, we need to do more executive level engagement. You're, you're dealing with the, you know, the people too low in the organization, which has happened to me a few times. Um, <laughs> well, right. you know, so, so where does the customer or maybe the customer marketer is inspired to try to lead this because it's not really happening yet uh, as a it, maybe it's uh, the random acts right now and they want to try to drive it as a more deliberate orchestrated approach. But, like where, where can they really start? No, it, no, I know it's Jeff. It's like the zillion dollar question. <laughs> um, so the first thing is always start small, right? Don't try to, you know, roll out some massive new program or even propose, you know, a massive new program. I think there's a bottom up and a top down way to think about it. So bottom up is to do a bit of an audit of what is already going on with executive engagement. And that can be informal. Are there key accounts where you know that your CEO or your head of sales or you know, a bunch of your top salespeople have relationships and have meetings and have calls? Um, within your existing program, who are the higher level people that you're already working with or you know, whether they've done references or testimonials, or they've spoken at your events. So do an audit of what you might have to work with to begin with. That's the bottom up approach um, because there's no one right answer to how to start. It's completely contextual. The top down is to look at what are the priority marketing and sales objectives for the company over the next year and where might they be improved with more effective executive engagement or, or executive relationships. So for example, you're rolling out a big new solution to market. Well, I mean, number one, if you're running a reference program, you know how important you know those early references are to give some credibility to that. Um, or maybe there's a, uh, you know, is there a campaign that's organized to support the rollout? So can you look for ways to involve senior executives in that campaign, whether it's PR, whether it's speaking, whether it's a case study or a testimonial, um, that. Everybody has thought leadership programs on this call. So that's another really good place to look. I mean, it's easiest within marketing, um, you know, so that would be one step down. So the highest top down is business strategy, you know, sort of corporate strategy. And what are the top objectives for the year? Is it, you know, entering a new market? Is it, you know, like I mentioned with this other company, it's like they need to get into HR. So it's sort of a new buying center which was important, you know, it was a lot of existing customers, but so that's the top down. And then the second tier top down is within your own marketing organization. Are there existing activities, but also what are the strategic objectives for marketing this year? And are there some particular ways in which even a few senior executives from your clients could be really helpful? And so can you propose, oh, well, let's organize a round table, a workshop, or just a series of interviews. Um, you know, the other one, a lot of people have customer satisfaction or net promoter score or those kinds of activities. And, you know, they may or may not be in your programs, you know, folks that are, that are still on with us right now. But that's a good way. Can you pull out an executive level cut from that? Or can you add one? Like, oh, you know what, in the next round, why don't we try interviewing 
a dozen or 25 senior executives. Let's go up a couple levels. You know, we have, uh, actually it's public because we, you know, they present. Unisys, which is a company we do a lot of work with, they've had a customer satisfaction program that was like four levels down in marketing, you know, kind of manager of customer satisfaction. We've been working with them for years. This is now a CEO driven program to strengthen relationships with their top 200 accounts and use those relationships to drive product and service innovation for the business. It's still being run by the woman who was a few years ago, the manager of customer satisfaction, but wow. she's now talking regularly with the CEO it's one of the CMO's top priorities. You know, so that's a that's a lot. That's a great story of how to start small and build and make something that's kind of tactical, more more strategic to the business. And it must be elevating her role as well. Oh it's my just, She's still running this program. I, and she's <laughs> like doing quarterly briefings for the CEO and and their whole C suite. Right. And, and so I love that top down advice you gave because that's exactly how Howard and I started this conference was to talk about what we, the way we phrase it is connecting your work to the strategic growth initiatives of your organization. Yeah. You know, find out what those are if you're not hearing them in company meetings or if they're not filtering down through the chain of command and make sure, you know, you talk to those executives and find out what those strategic growth initiatives, like you said, is there a major new launch going on, a major new focus on a new industry or a new role, a new new, exactly. new buying center. Uh, you know, is there a major you know land and expand strategy that the company's rolling out? And and there's almost always a way that you're going to find to do you know typical customer you know mobilizing customers to help drive that, as well as within that executives within yeah. your client sites on, on to to do that, especially as it relates to thought leadership. And as you know, companies are always branding and rebranding and rebranding and <laughs> and oftentimes you know there's a, oh some pillars God. there's pillars core pillars of the brand yeah. but i think i think the best rebranding efforts are when those core pillars correlate or demonstrate thought leadership and take thought provoking kind of challenging conventional thinking views on on those issues or and you know with perspectives points of view so um yeah, so, so, so again, just this is fantastic. I hope everybody enjoyed this as a customer marketer. Hopefully it got you thinking beyond where, where you might be focused today in terms of what's possible. And, and please encourage your, your senior executives, hey, this is something that we can do. This is something we're enabled to do. We're motivated and wanting to do. You know, let's connect it to your initiatives and, and see if it makes sense. No, that's great. So, and lots of lots of entry points. Right. Right. Lots right. of entry points to to take another step forward with this. So thank you again, Rob. Terrific. And thank you everybody for joining us here for day four.